Hello, uh, my name is Alberto Lavandeira. I'm the CEO of Atalaya Mining. Uh, this is a um, company mining copper in Spain with several growth projects in Spain and it's listed in uh, AIM with the symbol ATYM and also listed in, in Toronto, although our main board is, is London. Okay, um, hello and welcome Alberto, lovely to speak to you. Where, where in the world are you? I'm in the north part of Spain taking a kind of a break. Uh, out of the sunny heat of the southern part of Spain, where we have our operations and offices. I heard, I heard it's a massive heat wave in the, in the mid 40s, not very unpleasant. Um, well, look, um, we, I'm delighted to have you on board because we've been hunting around for uh, copper stories, trying to sort of see where all this copper that the world is going to need is going to come from. Um, there's not too many stories out there. You guys have got into production, which, which, is, which is a good start. So um, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, sort of go take you back to the beginning as to where did this start? What was the plan from day one? Because um, it's a sort of long history to this. You're right. This company has been renamed in, back in 2015 to Atalaya Mining. Uh, initially, it was a junior, it had been a long time permitting and getting through lots of troubles. And I joined the company back in mid-2014. Uh, at that time, it, ha- it was a project, uh, the Rio Tinto project, that had been sitting for over 15 years without any activity getting all kinds of rust because it had been built back in the 70s, 80s by Rio Tinto. This is the location where Rio Tinto Mining Company started over 150 years ago. So without any question, there's lots of copper there, has been lots of activities back from pre-Roman times, but still lots of copper to be mined. So our challenge when we got there uh, me and my team was to go and restart something that had been stopped for quite a while, being a small junior company without uh, much money. And how do we manage to put that into production in a, in a market that at that time was declining? The copper prices were going down from the highs of 2010 and 11. And in 2015, with peaks, it was clearly going down. So it has been a quite a long journey, but we are back and we fulfill our targets. And, and I would say much better than most people expected. Yeah, well, it's, it's been an interesting run. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But just I just want to stick with the whole kind of Spain component here. So Rio Tinto obviously built uh, the, the, the infrastructure in the 70s and 80s, sat dormant for quite a while, and you've had to come in and restart this thing. But some of the companies that come and talk to us who've got operations in Spain really struggle. They get local opposition. They don't get the support of local government or, quite frankly, federal government to do what they need to do. So is Spain a, a mining-friendly jurisdiction? Well, I'll tell you what's the reality. The reality is that there's lots of mines, and, uh, and it's not easy like it's not easy in any, any part. Today, we have lots of opposition, the anti-binding groups, environmental groups, and the extreme leftist groups are against uh, mining in general, but also against any industry. So when you are a foreign company, normally a, a, a junior company coming here with uh, foreign executives uh, without knowing the language and without knowing the rules, I would say is as difficult as in any other country. I just would ask you to imagine what would happen if a Greek company went to Australia to try to permit a mine in Australia without speaking English. That's often the problem uh, to help to adapt to the legislation. The mining law in Spain is coming from 1974. It's quite a long law. Uh, has Spain has had uh, mining companies like Cominco, where I work in three mines. Uh, Anglo-American, Rio Tinto, now the, the Potash, Coal, uh, First Quantum is there, Trafigura Mubadala is there, Grupo Mexico, Lundin. So there's lots of big companies working there. Does it mean it's easy? No, it's not easy like in any other place. The, the regulations are very complex. It's, uh, each autonomy has, each region has its own rules overimposed to the national rules and really the legal uh, frame is, is complicated. It doesn't mean they are not 
permits are not obtained. Uh, just we only need to look at uh, examples uh, for of tungsten in Salamanca with two mines, Los Santos and Arroco Pardo for Monday, W Resources, also Australian, also tungsten, uh, El Valle mine, uh, that's Urbana. Uh, the mine where I was, uh, you know, there gold mines where we permit uh, an open pit mine with signed, uh, besides a river with trout and salmon, and it's still running 25 years from now, uh, from then, still running today using silent so it's not complex it is difficult like in any other place but what, what were they doing wrong that you're doing right it's not it's more than just speaking spanish right it's 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 what else what, what is there to it well you were doing wrong well i don't, i'm not a person to judge the rest but i can tell you that my team has built five mines in spain uh so starting from scratch including permits and including operations. So um, we don't have any uh, people that are, we train the local people, the engineers and so on, and try to do it uh, using the best examples you can find in the world. What, let me say, what I would do differently? Well, probably not rely only in, um, in some people coming from outside and consultants, because consultants are often there to sell you hours. They're not there to solve your problems. Uh, so you have to have a experience. You have to have done it before in order to be able to say no or to say yes in the right moment. This is not a problem in Spain. It's a problem worldwide. Um, most of the juniors do not have the technical capabilities and the team and the effort that it requires and the money that it requires and have to go through consultants, which sometimes you're lucky to have the good ones or not. Uh, and then is the consultant companies who are driving the development of our project. And this is different to big companies that have their own technical teams and the knowledge in-house to be able to judge and guide the consultant. There's no question that the consultants know or have people that know how to do things, but sometimes they require guidance. It's, it's, interesting. Like, it's interesting to us because we have a lot of companies come on and they talk about the theory of getting into production. They talk about the theory of, of, of building a mine and, and, that, and that sounds great. Great. It's a very easy conversation to have. It's the, you know, It'll, it, it, the, the could be, the maybe conversation. You're, what I've heard there from you is you're saying it's the same the world over. If you built mines before, you can find it easier to build a mine this time around. So investors have got a choice to make. They either invest in riding the equities market or they invest in the company and, and their ability to actually get into production and create genuine value. Okay. It, but there's nothing unique about Spain in that regard. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I don't think so. Look, uh, the same has been always said from Turkey, where it's uh, it's very difficult to get projects into production, but they are projects uh, into production and they are foreign companies. But the language is difficult and the law is complicated and the landscape and the environmental is tough sometimes, but it's done. So it doesn't mean they're not a mining country. It's a great mining country. I think it's, you need to have local people that are, have the knowledge and you have people managing that also have the knowledge. This is no different. Uh, I think building mines is difficult in all over the world. It's not difficult in Spain. It's difficult all over the world. And you only need to see how many mines are really built by juniors in the world. Not very many. And the reason is simple. Most of the value is, is, is added in exploration teams where they talk about creating value and get into production. But what they mean is that they want to sell it to somebody. I've been there. <laughs> I know what I mean. Yeah, no, I, th I, th I think that's true. So in terms of um, local objection, I just wanted to, I want to deal with this because we, we spend a lot of time talking to investors about jurisdictional risk, right? So you think Spain, you can do business in Spain just as well as you can anywhere else. If you are a mind builder, 
you have your own team, you're not relying on consultants. So, you know, and obviously there's mining law and, and uh, which is going to, going to affect your ability to do stuff and, and permits and, li and licensing, et cetera. But the thing you can't really control is local objection to building, i.e. not in my backyard, please. There's a, there's a lot of that all around the world. Is, is Spain any, any more severe in that regard or is it the same as anywhere else? I would say it's the same as anywhere else. We have two examples in our own combat. We have a total favorable position from where we are located in Rio Tinto, where, I mean, we are loved. Uh, people support us, we get agreements, we have no problem with the unions, with the communities. We have houses only 200 meters out of the border of the pit. I mean, we have a public road crossing the pit, so it's, we are basically mining in front of people. We make sure that there's a similar anything like that. And we have an opposition in another project we have in the north part of Spain, it's called Toro, where um, we have some anti groups making a lot of noise. And although we have a full support locally where the project is going, some people from outside, people from 100 kilometers away or wherever, are really making noise to try to make sure that this thing is not permitted. But the same way, they are opposing any other mining projects, any, any quarry. They are also opposing windmills. They are opposing paper mill. They are opposing everything. Uh, so this uh, is a type of life that we have to live today. Okay. Um, well, like, okay, so I pre appreciate the kind of jurisdictional o overview there. Um, Tell me, come back to this business plan. What, what did you actually set out to do? Because if I, if I look at your guidance that you issue, you're, you're at the top end of your guidance now that you're in production. Um, and, and we should get into the numbers in a second. But what did you actually set out to do when you, when you joined in 2014? Look, I joined 2014. I always joke saying that probably I had too much drinks the night before because it was a company that had been stopped for a long time and uh, had no money and had no team. So it was very tough. Um, what we have to do, the first thing was relook again at the, at the plan, the business plan. The business plan was calling for an investment of 300 million US dollars to be completed after a permitting had been obtained and financing had been obtained. Uh, during three years. First of all, we looked at it and said, there's no way we can finance this. So what can we cut? And the first thing we said, can we do it for a fraction of that? Can we cut what's not really needed? Can we make some shortcuts? Can we do it differently? And we managed uh, to say, well, we are going to be saving at least the first put into production, we are going to save at least 50 million euros, around $60 million. Well, I know people smile and say, well, okay, good luck to them. I've heard this before. The reality is we ended up saving much more than that. And immediately we embarked in the second phase to expand the, the project. So we ended up, instead of 300 million, we ended up doing the whole thing in two years, not in three. We ended up doing that before having the financing and we ended up spending about half of that. It's almost a miracle, I have to say, when you look back. And there are reasons why we did it uh, and how we did it. But the key and most difficult part was to be able to finance that and construct that without big dilution, uh, with minimum equity, and using a lot of imagination. Um, okay, Alberto, give me a little bit of your background here, because I'm hearing a lot about the ability to get mines into production, that, that intrigues me because it's not just, oh, I, I know how to tell a story, I know how to promote, which, which is important. But if that's all you've got, I think the company's got a problem. So, but, so tell me about your background in terms of getting mines into production. Yeah, well, the first thing is before getting mines into production, you really have to participate in the production. I'm a mining engineer. I started working in January of 79. So... Very soon, I will be, what, 42 years mining, which is a lot, 43, actually. Initially, a shift boss working at a mine, then planning engineer, mining engineer. And only when I had, and this was with big companies like Cominco, which is tech, the old tech, and now the new tech. 
or Anglo American or Rio Tinto. After that, I moved to some projects where I, they, I was project manager specifically, and each time with more experience until I joined Rio Norte Gold Mines, which was something very similar to this. It was a junior company with two Spanish shareholders, but basically listed in London, where we, we permitted and constructed and, uh, and built and operated a, a mine, a gold copper mine in Spain, as I said before, very complex with cyanide, the open pit, close to a river with salmon and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then we built another one called, uh, well, another one which is also gold and underground in Spain. Then a third, that was without, a, all of them without a mill, with a mill. Then we built another one called uh, Agua Blanca, which was uh, nickel and copper open pit besides a park. And I mean, besides is basically 100 meters away from a, a natural park in the side of the river. And, uh, and we also bought a company uh, and went into, into Mauritania, which is now um, the Tassias mine, which is now owned by Kinross, which we saw it was very cheap and we had experience. And we went there and using a kind of lateral thinking instead of, this was a Canadian company who had a company. The, the company and we did it in a slightly different way. After that, we were bought out by Lundin. Lundin made an offer. So a company that uh, 12 years ago started with 10 persons was bought by 1 billion Canadian at that time, a little bit more than 1 billion. And then me, uh, some people moved to other places, stayed with Lundin. We were bought by Lundin Mining. And uh, I went to a Congo to another project in a JV with Glencore, <coughs> where we went from nothing to, to building a mine, a huge mine, obviously with the money and technology and everything of Glencore and support of Glencore, with an investment of around 1.8 billion and to invest 200,000 tons of copper cathodes in starting from jungle, really clearing off termite bonds uh, to, to see in the production. At that moment, uh, after seven years also, Glencore bought us out, bought the company out, it was a private company. And that's when I was drunk enough to come and, uh, and join Atalaya, or what it was at that time, even mine. So, and then we had again the experience of building three phases of Rio Tinto. Uh, to Rio Tinto, I brought back some of the key elements of people that have been working with me in the last 20 years, plus others that they had been also dealing with. So the, the key here from our 470 employees is to have, uh, I would say, 10 persons that are honest, hard workers and experienced. And they really go every morning to work with a lot of joy and uh, regardless of what they are being paid. Uh, I can tell you that I wouldn't need to be working with my age, uh, but I enjoy every day that I go to work. And that's, I think, has been the success of this company. Is the team we have a fantastic, fantastic team? Okay, well, tell me, tell me about the team then. Who did you bring in? When we got this project, we had a person which is now in our, is not in our company, which was Julian Sanchez, which had been with me fifteen years. He was a chief operating officer, and he really was the person that really got this thing into production. But we had other people in 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 the mining or in the process that. I had or had been working with me back when we were in, in that region or fair gold mines as uh, basically shift bosses. So imagine now people that are engineers, uh, metallurgical engineers that they started 20 years ago, started from down below. Now they have uh, lots of experience and there's mutual trust. And these guys uh, make the difference. They know how to, they have seen the operation, but they've also seen how it, goes through building. Uh, building is not that difficult. Uh, what's more difficult is to go into the transition from building to, to operating successfully. Um, because it's, people think there's a technology, but it's not only that. You have to set up the lab, the, the laboratory, you have to set the, the purchasing, the maintenance, the, the, the IT, the administration, all of it with, with, without anybody, with a very small base. 
And that's the most difficult part of, uh, of uh, really getting something into production. So just so this is not necessarily a question about Atalaya, but I, I'm, I'm intrigued because when, again, when we get companies coming on here, especially with explorers, right, there's always a new technology. There's new AI is going to change the world. There's lots of, you know, big reasons why they're going to be more successful than anyone who's gone before. Okay. With production has much Changed. I mean, I'm, I sh I'm sure there's efficiencies, you know, small incremental changes, but has anything fundamentally changed? Does, do mine builders today look any different from mine builders 20 years ago? No, I don't think so. I think you only need to be, you only need to be up to the last uh, knowledge of the state of the art of what's been done in other places. You don't need to invent the wheel. I mean, we have, we are modest and, and we know where, who has the technology and who is doing it well. So for example, although everybody in the team is Spanish and generally, but we are not shy to go and contract out uh, engineering from Australia and from South Africa to build uh, our projects and to help us in the startup and in the commissioning, because that, those are the people that have done it before and know it. So um, this is the important thing. You, you need to, to find the technology where it is. But of course, having somebody on top to, to kind of direct where, what's the direction you want to go. They can build you a, a Rolls Royce and they will really love it because they will, they will spend a lot of hours and send you lots of people to do it, but that's not what we want. So you need to know, of course you need to know but you have to find it in only where it is. What has changed in the past? Well, I don't think much has changed. What has changed is the control. Today you have uh, computers, you can have things that control um, things, uh, you supervise things in an automatic way that were not there 20 years ago. But this is not from this year. This is something known in the in the places that have been in the forefront of the, of the mining, like, uh, uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, Australia, uh, Canada, and in some ways, some parts of South America. Okay. So simply, you pick up whoever does it best, and there's no secret today. Okay, okay. That's interesting. So I appreciate the background. It's just the first time we've spoken, so I'm just intrigued. And a little bit of history, a little bit about you and the, and the team, because that's effectively what you, people need to be buying into. Let's talk about the project. Um, do you want to run through, uh, you, you, you put out an income, uh, income statement recently. Do you want to run through the high line numbers there? Um, because look, you're in, you're in production. The only thing I can, I could possibly have a go at you about is, well, could your margins be better? Could you, could the growth um, profile look a bit better in terms of production? But uh, let, let's start with the, where you are today and, you know, and then we'll maybe get into where you could be going. Yeah. Look, um, let's start by, by the back, I mean, what's what the asset we have? We have an asset which is a, an old asset. I mean, it's, a, it's an asset that when I arrived here in 2014 had a 12 years life at a grade of 0.42, 43%, uh, running at 9 million tons per year. So it was 123 million tons rock that you would treat and you would be running for 12 years. Well. It's not rich. It's something that's now it's becoming the norm in the new products in the world because the, the high grades have gone. So with that type of deposit, which is not rich, you have to manage. What we have done is expand the reserves. We drilled in the beginning. So after being mining during six years and after expanding now 50% more than the original plan, we still have 12 years. So the first thing is, add optionality to your asset. So in this now 18 years, you will pick up high grade, sorry, high metal prices, which then will give you a lot of optionality. This is the first point. Second point is that we have, when we have, we have a low grade asset. So it's not our fault, it is what it is. We are as efficient as we can to make money with it. Some companies have high grade assets, they're rich assets. And sometimes they, they become lazy because they make money anyway. In our case, we have to be very efficient to make money with what we have. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's what we have done. With a small asset, we have been able to, to maintain 
a profile of production that has been constant and getting quite good uh, margins. Yeah, there are there are high grade copper projects out there, but they don't necessarily yet have the scale. And you know, you're obviously down at the lower end in terms of where you're at about point four T. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna start again. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. I lost. Okay. Let's start again. Okay, and yeah, obviously there are projects which are you know high grade. We've seen pr projects um, in Ecuador, you know, five percent sort of levels, but they don't have the this, this scale yet. Um, and there is this you know supply demand story going on, which people can see in your in your in your PowerPoint because you kind of cover it reasonably well. Um, you're at the lower end of that at 0.4 T. You do need to be efficient, but you and you and you. I, I get the fact that life of mine is still 12 years, which 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 is great. But you're also thr you're throwing off this free cash flow at the moment. Is it a? Are you just going to focus on Spain? I mean, where where does the growth come from from investors? I get the free cash, but you've got to do something with it, or else it just sits in the bank. So what what's going to happen with that money? Look, the cash flow that we are producing right now is the, the result of what for our investments and efforts from the past. But the same way that we have advanced the reserves at Rio Tinto, we are also we are also uh, getting additional reserves and growth in the projects in Spain. So we are adding for more reserves at Rio Tinto, where we have invested big time. Those are the projects called San Dionisio, San Antonio, and Massa Valverde. So all those will probably likely extend another 10 years additional life to our assets. And also we have another project in the north part of Spain called Toro, where we will have another project which very likely will be from 15 to 20 years life. Does it mean we're not looking in other parts of the world? No, we are looking on other parts of the world we've been looking for the last five years. But uh, we're only looking to places where we can add value, places where we have um, where we have uh, the language advantage, the size advantage, the metal advantage, the knowledge. So not any, just not the not growth for growth. If if we don't find anything worth investment, of course we will not invest. Uh, will we return money to the shareholders? Of course, yes. Uh, right now, until now, we were didn't have that luxury. But of course, uh, just common sense is that uh, we will be generating uh, cash flow equivalent to over one fourth of our market cap this year. If things continue this way, obviously, this is not going to sit in the balance sheet just forever. Uh, at all. So the logical thing is, is to probably start a form of, of payback uh, to the shareholders again, uh, the money they have put in, and still maintain the possibility of growth. Uh, a company that doesn't grow is dead. Uh, that's what provides stability long term, and that's what provides optionality. So that's needed without any question. Okay, so d dividends at some point to, to be announced when? When do you make that decision? Yeah, dividends. Uh, sometimes this year, as I said, uh, very likely because the common sense tells you that we are not going to be sitting in that cash forever. We have it uh, until now. We have not had the luxury. Uh, the dividends, I believe, uh, we believe in the, in the company have to be sustainable. Have to be something that's uh, not going to be one day and the next is not going to disappear. And you have to leave uh, certain money there, certain cash, in order to able to to continue your operations to grow. Because the key of a company is, is to have a sustainability, to have a long life, to have optionality. So you don't want to just to basically empty the box and then disappear. That uh, wouldn't make too much sense. Okay, so you, you've got a story, and it's, it's a well-told story in the sense of what you're doing with your, your current assets. And the M&A component, just, it just interests me because it, we're looking around, we're trying to find projects which have credibility, right? You know, there, there's a lot of stories. People are you know, pulling out the bottom drawer, pulling out a project because copper price is high. You, you know, your share price has doubled since October last year, which is, you know, in line with what the copper price has done. I'm sure you've done a lot of work too, but the copper price has done a lot of heavy lifting for you. Okay, so when you were looking at M and A, you were looking at perhaps projects which are overvalued at the moment, for, as far as you're concerned. So do you need to make a call? Well, there's two things. Y your cash is building up as a result, which is great, but things are overpriced, which is not so great. So does that affect your the timing of when you start looking at stuff? 
Look, uh, we have been looking at this when the prices were low. Actually, what we got into total when the prices were going down and we had no money. That's where we were able to get a deal basically without having to pay big up months up front. Same thing happened also with uh, these things of Massa Valverde. We got it when the prices were down and when we almost had no money. Uh, right now, the projects or some of them are expensive expensive and projects or companies, but there are opportunities. But they had to create some value for both parts. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to pay a premium for somebody that's already overpaid because there will be no return. So we'd rather sit down and wait. We have no rush at all. Places where we have to, where we can add is places, is things that are too small for big companies where there's no competition. Nobody's, a big company is not going to be interested in a 30,000 tons producer or 40,000 tons producer. And it's probably too big because it's a junior company that has a, a, a group of 10 people that are, they are totally unable to finance and to get this thing up and running. So those are the type of projects that we're looking at. Things that are, yes, they want to be mines, but they're never going to be mined. So we can offer a merger where both, of both companies and both shareholders benefit from the upside. Uh, but we are not going to just doing big payments of cash just to to get the, the troubles out of those juniors with uh, that want to be bought. Well, th- see, this interests me. It gives, gives me, as an investor, a sense of what I would be buying into. Because if you're targeting projects which are too small for majors to be interested in or, or some of the, the, the large caps to be interested in, you're talking about put, building a portfolio of smaller projects, you know, which, you know, the, the bottom line is it looks like a big number, but it's lots of small projects dotted around the place. So you're not building yourself to be a takeover target from a Rio or a BHP or, or any, any of those kind of mid-tier players. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't think we are a target for one of these big, big players. They look for things that are much bigger. It could be a target for medium players because we are in production, generating nice cash flow and have future. That's a different story, but we are not so worried about being a target or not. If we are, it's fine. I have, I have gone through that in the past, and I did what I want is to have the best uh, for all the shareholders. But uh, we are not working on that and that uh, premise. I mean, it happens and happens. Okay, how, how long are you going to stay involved for? Well, as, as soon as I, uh, as much as I can. I mean, I, as I say, I love working in the, every morning. So, and I. I'm quite young. I mean, I feel quite young. I don't know if I am or not. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, that's important. Um, can you just describe to me what good looks like when, you, when you're looking at other companies? Because again, it just gives us a sense of you, you built mines, you know what you're looking for. In terms of jurisdiction, in terms of size, in terms of grade, in terms of you know what the potential you see in front of you. Because again, we, we see a lot of stories, and some of them seem like very hopeful very wishful stories. What do you look for? We look for metals that have future. And those, I think, the copper is the main one. Also, nickel could be interesting. Metals where we can add value, things where we know. We know about coal, we know about copper, we know about things. So you will not see us in in coal, in diamonds, in in industrial minerals, in iron. I mean, those, we don't have experience. So why get into that? We look to jurisdictions where we can add some value. So Spain, Portugal, maybe Europe, South America, uh, language connection is very important. So that's the type of things. We look at sizes, uh, as I say, market caps from 100 million to 500 million. You will not see us getting things of billions. I mean, what for? That's the, the war of the companies. And that was the, the key points. I mean, and I, and maybe products that are the pure exploration yet so something that we don't have to wait 10 years most of these stories that you see around are not going to be mines in 10 years if if lucky and we don't want that we need things that we can add value soon okay just looking at your press releases it's very functional right and by that i mean you you talk a lot about you know the the regulatory stuff the stuff you're obliged to talk about you don't go out and tell stories about potential of future so much. You're not. You don't give regular updates. Do you think that is that because of who you're targeting in terms of the, your investor 
audience? I mean, oh yes, I think we are. We are a credible. We want to be a credible producer, and uh, the same way that uh, that the big companies and doesn't mean we want to be big companies. They never announce discoveries or discovery holes. Uh, I mean, that's not their game. Their game is is to be, I mean, we had a discovery, for example, Mahalales three years ago of a new deposit, and we didn't even announce it simply because it was an option. Why? Because that would not mean anything and it would only make our option more expensive. Actually, what we did is, is, is bought it later at a lower price because it was not good enough for for the price we were we had the, we had the option for. So we are not in the game of releasing in real results. We may, if there's something exceptional that can make a change, announce it, yes. Uh, but we are, let's say, with all the respect I can, that we are not promoters by such. I mean, we are not promoters that we'll be announcing now. We are starting a geophysical program. We are executing the geophysical program. The next one, we have found a fantastic anomaly that may be or may not be. Oh, and then the third, the fourth one is, is the good excuse why that anomaly was not that, but it could be the next one. No, we are not that style. We, we say we are going to be producing that and we will do it. It's simply probably different styles. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's interesting because when you look at the, like 2020, when it, things got very frothy, very, very exciting, there were lots of news stories and they did this promotional style and they have benefited from this promotional style in terms of the share price appreciation. People very, very interested in it. it, it I get, I get it's different styles. Do you not look at that and go, well, maybe, maybe we need to just be a little no, bit more? Look, you're right. I think we have, we have been wrong in lots of things. I've seen some valuations of other companies that I, that I find uh, incredible. But I think we are here for the long term and we will get there. I, think we're, I don't think people were trusting what we were saying. I think people didn't see us performing as we said that we would. Now I think people will start seeing and comparing with others. But you're right. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, the big performers from 2000, 2020 were from a very low base. True, true. And and there, and there, there are there are a few who who perhaps are all about the story and less about the substance for for sure. Um, but it's very hard for the market market to de decipher. Does that slightly irritate you that perhaps people who should, who should be investing in yours are, are flocking elsewhere? Because the story sounds good. No, no, no. Uh, it doesn't worry me too much. I think it's just a pity. And I, I tell whoever I can say like they should buy us because we are cheap. And uh, even I, when I have bought my uh, some shares myself, whenever I had the, the opportunities. Uh, no, I, I don't look at others. I just find it incredible that uh, that some companies promise and promise, and people still believe them. But anyway, uh, it's not. We, we never look at the other people. We we try to do our own, and time will prevail. Mining is a long term game. Mining is something that you don't do. You see, you don't want this huge volatility, these ups and downs with share price going up and then disappointing and coming by half. I don't think our share price will half. Uh, I think our share price may double. Uh, while in other some of these other companies have a lot of froth, the moment they have to start to deliver their shares will have, as we have seen in the past with some, even some London listed stocks. I agree with you. Alberto, wonderful uh, introduction to your company and appreciate your time today. Um, we have got to stay in touch with you because I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by what you've done. You've delivered at the top end of your guidance consistently and I, um, I think it'll be an interesting one to watch over the next uh, 18, 24 months for sure. Thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity of, of, of being able to show a little bit of our story. The story of, of Atalaya, which actually is quite simple, a company in the right metal, which is copper, probably the metal of the future. I would say the age of copper producing, then we can benefit from, from being in this metal, not just future. We're talking about present, long life, because this cycle is going to work. In a safe jurisdiction, Spain may be difficult, but once you are there, you're not going to be changing the role of the post posts like you have in other countries. And with people that always uh, fulfill their promises, which I think at the end is one of the things I always look for investments. Uh, I like 
reliable investments where people would promise me and then uh, I get a disappointment in the future because they didn't fulfill what they said. So thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to explain you a little bit of what we do and what we are going to be continuing to do.